delighted to have you all here, and I'm also really excited about this event. Um, so this event is obviously looking at oscillations, the theme of our exhibition outside. If you haven't had a chance to explore it yet, you'll have time after the, after the talks tonight. Um, and really, oscillations are things that are in motion, things that move, that vibrate, that wobble, that wiggle, that pulse, beat and tick. So basically anything that has some sort of repetition to it. And something that I've discovered um, throughout the course of this exhibition is that oscillations are everywhere. They're sort of ubiquitous. Um, so I can't stop seeing oscillations now, and I should also introduce myself. My name is Jane Chadwick. I work at the Science Gallery here. Um, and in my past life, I was a volcanologist, uh, a geologist. So my kind of things that are very close to my heart are sort of Earth systems. And when this exhibition opened, I started seeing oscillations, not just in kind of very straightforward things like, say, a swinging pendulum or a kind of spring with a weight on the end, your heartbeat, for example, in biology, or uh, your neuronal waves in your brain, or even in economic systems, the boom and bust of an economic uh, system, or also feedback in a guitar ramp, if you want. Um, I started seeing them in much bigger systems, so in things that affect us in terms of the, the whole Earth. So climate systems, for example, the weather that you are unfortunately experiencing uh, coming to Science Gallery. Um, also in Earth systems in terms of earthquakes, uh, volcanoes, which are obviously my, my uh, personal favorite as a volcanologist, things that resonate with the entire Earth, and then also even oscillations that go off Earth, so out into the solar system and beyond. And that's really what we're going to be talking about here tonight. And obviously, I'm not fully qualified to talk about all of those things, so I'm really delighted that we have an expert panel here with us today who are going to help me in this. Um, we're going to have a very informal setup, so we're going to have a conversation. It's not going to be sort of the standard academic talks. And in that, we have really great experts from diverse fields who are going to help us in that. Um, so first off, we have uh, a mathematician and meteorologist, but don't hold the weather against him, uh, Connor Sweeney from, from UCD. Uh, sitting beside him, we have uh, Professor Chris Bean over from UCD as well, who's a geophysicist and geologist, and he's going to kind of elucidate things around uh, earthquakes, I suppose. And sitting beside Chris, representing for Trinity College in, in Dublin, is Ian Sanders, Professor Ian Sanders, who's... Uh, basically a meteorite expert, as well as being a mineralogist and geologist and just general legend. Uh, Ian taught me as a student. <laughs> um, so we're going to have a conversation about different, uh, different oscillations uh, here tonight. Um, and I hope over the course of the evening as well, we'll have a question and answer session at the end. And I hope you'll all join in um, and throw us uh, any questions that you might have about macro oscillations. We'll do our best to field them. Um, and Really, I kind of want to start off by talking about why should we care about macro oscillations? So obviously we should care about heartbeats and your brain waves, but macro oscillations also have a huge impact on our daily lives. So climate variation, for example, is probably going to be something that has a, a much increased impact on your daily life uh, in the next coming years. Uh, obviously things like earthquakes and volcanoes, if you live in a, the right area, can have a huge impact. But even things that are off planets, um, Obviously, people living in Russia a few weeks ago learned about um, solar system impacts in their own backyard. So we're going to talk a little bit about oscillations and how they, how they kind of connect together as well. So it's not just that we're looking at distinct systems. We're going to try and see if there's links between them. So it's quite an ambitious evening <laughs> to go, go from Earth uh, and beyond in, in the space of about an hour. But I think we can, we can get there. And really, I want to start it off kind of close to home and accessible, um, maybe <laughs> more accessible, uh, with, with uh, Dr. Connor uh, over here, who's going to talk about seasonal cycles and, and weather and things that are a little close to home. And for me, um, this is really not my field of expertise, but I, like everyone else, watches the weather forecast and, you know, it's the subject of conversation any, anywhere you go in any taxi or bar. I would be really curious to find out um, what goes into weather prediction? Um, so the, the predictions that you see on television, how do you come up with them? How reliable are they? And are there oscillations involved? Uh, well, that's, that's a great question, Jane. Um, <clears throat> the first question that everybody seems to ask me is, is why do you get it wrong so often? So I'm glad you didn't start <laughs> off with that. Um, 
Forecasting uh, the weather, and in Ireland we're blessed with the weather, although we may not feel that way so much, because it changes so much. We have a, a wide variety of, of different types of things that can happen during any season. Um, but overall, the way that we predict the weather, be it here or anybody else on the Earth, is, is by computer models. So weather forecasting, although you may not think of it being so, is very much a mathematical uh, field. Uh, largely mathematicians and uh, physicists would be involved. And before we can predict the weather, let's say here in Dublin or in Ireland, uh, we need to predict the weather over the whole of the Earth, because it's a global system. And the weather that's happening over America right now will travel west to east and affect us in, in two or three days. So the first thing we need is lots and lots of information about what the weather's like now. We put that all into a computer model that covers the whole globe and we run that. And then we run a, a, another computer model that's a higher resolution just over Ireland and a bit of Europe. And that's how we get the prediction of what's going to happen to us for our weather. Uh, so it involves an awful lot of maths and an awful lot of supercomputers. Um, but as well as involving just maths uh, and, and big equations, it does involve oscillations in, in many different forms. And they can be from very, very large oscillations at, at planetary scale, thousands of kilometers long and wavelength, right down to teeny tiny little oscillations. Uh, there's uh, a meteorologist called Lorenz that, that started off interest in an area of maths called chaos. Uh, which some of you may know through the movie Jurassic Park, if you're of my vintage. Um, the idea is, and one of the popular quotes, is that even the flapping of a butterfly's wings could, could change the, the event of a, chaos, a chaotic tornado or, or hurricane somewhere else on the Earth. So the Earth is very sensitive to these oscillations, be they large or small. Um, there are... I guess there are a variety of them that we try and capture within our computer models. The very large ones uh, are called Rosby waves or planetary waves. And, and if you've ever flown between here in America and back, you'd be familiar with these types of waves because they're also called the jet stream. When we fly from Ireland, of course, to America, we're battling the jet stream. It's coming towards us. When we're flying from America to Ireland, we're kind of surfing the jet stream. And that's why it's quicker to fly from America to Ireland than from Ireland to America. Um, but this jet stream isn't just a straight stream that comes from America towards us. It wobbles. And the reason it wobbles is the same as a lot of oscillations. Uh, it's, it's pitched a little bit away from where it wants to be, and then it tries to get back there. There's a restoring force, in this case, vorticity or potential vorticity. So if you're coming over the Rockies and you're this great big jet stream and you're going wee towards the Earth, the Rockies bump you up and you get deflected a little bit to the north. But you don't like that because now you're kind of more twisty. So you turn around a little bit back towards where you were and you overshoot it and you go down further south. And then you have to go back up again. And you see these big waves high up in the atmosphere, the jet streams, and they'll circle the North Pole. There'll be about maybe seven of them at any time, between three and 11. And that's, I guess, the largest oscillation scale of the atmosphere. But it can go right down to tiny, tiny little oscillations as well, uh, such as these small little butterfly wings or or uh, uh, atmospheric variations in wind. And all of these things have a restoring force that will try and bring them back towards equilibrium. And as they overshoot that, we can get different oscillations of different sizes. So if <laughs> that Jurassic Park scene left a big <laughs> impact on me when I saw it as a kid, um, but if things like butterfly wings flapping can have an impact on gigantic weather systems, that must be, make your modeling very, very difficult. It, and I, I suppose you can probably blame inaccuracies in weather forecasts yeah, on, on, on that, things like that, can you? That's exactly what we blame. We always blame the butterflies. <laughs> blame the butterflies. <laughs> so uh, it starts off the question of how we can predict the weather at all, because um, if you're going to have, if you're so sensitive to tiny little changes, and we can't possibly know what's happening around the atmosphere at any one time, then how will we know what's going to happen in the future? And our redemption as forecaster lies in the fact that it takes time for the energy to be transferred from these small scales up to the large scales. And that gives us our, our window, our predictability window. So we can forecast at the moment up to around seven days. We have what we call predictability skill, which basically means that our model can do better than you randomly guessing what the weather's going to be like. And if we can't do better than that, it's not very good. So, and so that's the time it takes for these small scales to feed up to the large scales. And beyond that time, seven to 10 days, then what you're saying happens, that the, the noise just overtakes the whole initial condition so that you could randomly pick any day in the history of that date and you'd be just as likely to get the forecast right. But that doesn't blow everything away because a lot of people then go, but you're saying it's going to get warmer in 100 years. You can't tell me if it's going to rain in five days, so how can you possibly tell me that? Uh, and that's part of the beauty of the Earth's system. It's bounded. So, so we may not know exactly what's going to happen in 10 days, but we know that if we push the Earth system a little bit harder, it'll react in a different way. 
And climate models aren't trying to tell us is it going to rain on Wednesday in 100 years. It's going to try and tell us if we start pushing a little bit harder, will this change the whole way that our Earth system acts? And that's what we try and do with the climate models. So if we're looking at how the system reacts, we can say things about decades and centuries in advance. But if you want to know if it's going to rain on your, on your wedding day, you shouldn't ask anyone until it's about a week away from your wedding day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, good to know. Um, so you were kind of touching on, on climate change there um, with with your last uh, last comments, and I know um, I, I I have family members who kind of say this to me. You know, it's it's freezing outside. How how is it how is it that it's you know global warming? Um, so obviously, you know, the kind of weather that you experience day to day is very different to the climate, and, yeah, and, and and the system overall and how it might behave in the future. How do you go about kind of uh, mapping that out? That's uh, uh, the most difficult thing that we have to do in climate modeling today. It's the biggest challenge. There there will be a new IPCC, which is this global body that looks at climate um, science. They'll be coming out with a new report later on this year, and I think they're going to talk about the fact that the uncertainty is what we need to get a handle on. It's not, is it going to get warmer? It's how, how sure are we about how warm it's got to get? And even more importantly, what's the spread? Could it go way warmer or way cooler, or how likely is it to, to be somewhere around the edges or the extremes of our models? And we get around that by running lots and lots and lots of models. So every model calculates the climate in a slightly different way. Um, and they're all the best models we have. So we can't say this model's right and those other 50 are wrong. So we run all of them. We run all of our models and we look at the output of all of them to try and get a view of the ranges of what can happen in the future. Uh, and this is interesting because it may get three degrees warmer, which sounds like it might be a nice thing in Dublin. Uh, <laughs> but it's the extremes that are worrying. If it gets three degrees warmer, but but we get more extremes, then even in Dublin, uh, we could have these, these terrible cold periods as well as these terrible warm periods or these terrible floods that will sink the Dundrum shopping centre or whatever may happen. I mean, and, and all of these things are consistent within a possibly small shift in the average of the future. Uh, so that's why we, we gain uh, an idea about uncertainty in the future. Okay, so... I, I, that was kind of leading into what I wanted to ask you about next. In terms of models that you're running, do you have uh, a clear kind of prediction for for Ireland and Dublin, or uh, in the in the near future to the, uh, far future? Well, the the good, the good news for Ireland is that um, we're not going to be nearly as strongly affected as most other parts of the globe. Uh, we're, we're really fortunate why, because, why? Yeah, <laughs> be, because of the Gulf Stream. So this, this wonderful current of air, or current of water, which heats the air, which comes up from the Gulf of Mexico, comes towards us. Ha, another wonderful movie, The Day After Tomorrow, um, <laughs> involved a actually not as completely unrealistic view as you may think. It, it involved the shutdown of this current of warm water that comes from um, Florida up towards Ireland. And this warm water moderates the air. It heats the air above it, and that keeps our climate in Ireland to be quite moderate. So we don't get really, really hot or really, really cold because of the influence of the sea around us. Um, were that current to shut down, which is what they talked about in that disaster movie, it would cause a very large difference. But that's not at all likely to happen within centuries to millennia uh, in any uh, of our physically realistic futures. Um, so, so the outlook for Ireland may look really good or, or may look somewhat neutral in, in the average, but of course we could still be exposed to these extremes, these, these floods, these flash floods, these changes in precipitation patterns and temperature extremes. And even were we not affected by these as much as other parts of the world, we are part of the world. I mean, we buy things and ship things and interact with, with the globe. So even from an economic point of view, it, we have to get a handle on this and how it's going to affect us, even if not directly, then indirectly. Okay. And how much fluctuation, would you say, comes into the, you know, you've, you're talking about predicting many hundreds of times yeah. what might happen in the future. How much, what's the sort of spread? What's the best case and worst case scenarios that you guys have yeah, for, there's, for global, there's, global climate change? There's a really, there's a really quite a wide spread, but the spread depends on how much we push the system. So if we're talking about the Earth system in behaving in a way like an, an oscillating device. Then we'll push it and it'll go out and it'll come back again. And the harder we push it, the further away we can expect these extremes to be. Um, uh, and we do this by modeling a whole load of different types of futures. One of them is when we try and reduce greenhouse gases as much as possible, or, or at least limit the amount of them in the atmosphere. And that means we're not pushing the Earth system as hard. And in that case, the extremes from the, the worst to the best are, are, are all below the extremes of those cases where we push it a bit harder. So if we start burning everything and go, hey, let's 
blow all the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Uh, then we're pushing the Earth system harder, and then we do see that we get more extremes that will cover the low extremes, but go way, way beyond and much higher into, in, into the top extreme that you would not see if you push it more gently. Well, actually, I think that's, you know, talking about sort of things that can push into extremes, it's probably a good idea to start talking to Chris uh, now about um, some sort of extremes that can happen because of, of, of Earth systems uh, on a kind of uh, a crustal level, I suppose. Um, so sort of catastrophic geological things like earthquakes and, and uh, volcanic eruptions. There are kind of instances of... of climate interacting with these both these features and potentially feeding back on them. Yeah, the, as, as Connor was saying, the, I mean, the whole system is actually connected uh, at some level, but the main, the main driver for what happens in the Earth's crust, the main reason why we get earthquakes, for example, is also related to you, what you can think of as a very large scale convection, which in itself is a type of oscillation. So deep in the Earth, we have the Earth's mantle, and it is convecting slowly um, maybe this, if you tracked any one point in, in the mantle, it's moving at about the speed that your nails grow, but it's relentlessly convecting or moving. And it's moving because the Earth's mantle is hot. And the reason it's hot, uh, there are two reasons. One is there's some residual heat from the formation of the planet, and, and maybe Ian will say something about that later, or, or maybe not, but uh, that in general, I'm not sure. Um, but that's not the only reason why it's hot and moving. In fact, Lord Kelvin, as in degrees Kelvin without, without the degree, um, <laughs> he, uh, he underestimated the age of the Earth because he thought that all of the heat inside the Earth was due to the original formation of the Earth. Um, but radioactive decay plays a huge role, and he didn't know anything about that. He was before, before we knew about that. So through radioactive decay and some original heat associated with the formation of the planet, we have this heat engine, essentially. And it actually is the reason why we live, and one of the reasons, at least, why we live in such an interesting place, because the planet is always renewing itself as a consequence of, of this convection. So it's driving the outer skin of the Earth, which is called the Earth's crust, is what it says. It's a crust. It's a kind of a crusty, hard part, relatively hard, on the outer skin. And it gets shifted around what we know as the plates uh, as the Earth's mantle convex. But the crust isn't large enough to cover the whole surface of the Earth. So you end up with gaps. So you end up with individual distinct plates. And then they interact. They rub off each other. They push against each other. They pull apart. And when they're doing that, they, you know, they, they're tending to stick and then slip and stick and then slip. And as they do that, they generate earthquakes. And it was interesting to hear you talking about uh, trying to forecast the weather. The big question you get <laughs> asked is, you know, why can't we predict earthquakes? And um, I mean, I think earthquake prediction the, uh, is actually one of the great failures in science. You know, we, we, you know if, if you stand back on it, or you could look in and say, how can you have spent so much, much resources on this and still not be able to predict earthquakes? And it's related to the idea of sensitivity as well. I mean, the, Earth's, uh, the individual parts of the Earth's crust are, first of all, their strength is not very well known. It's, we, we can't measure it everywhere, so we don't really know exactly how strong it is everywhere. And we don't exactly know how much stress or pressure is going into the system from the convection. So we don't have a handle on all the inputs um, for the system. And even if we did, we possibly wouldn't be able to say exactly when something's going to break. The analogy is the straw that breaks the camel's back. You, you're loading up the camel and you think, mm, you know, I, I don't want to make another trip. I'll put one more thing on the camel's back and, you know, the camel can't take it anymore. But we don't know where that point is. So therefore, it's very difficult to say when the, earth, uh, when the Earth's crust is going to break. So the idea of actually predicting the place and time of an earthquake, not to talk about years in advance, weeks in advance, even minutes in advance, it's just not possible at the moment. And there are analogies to what you talked about in the chaotic system. In this case, it's often called what's, what's often thought of as what's called a self-organized critical system. So it's critically unstable. And in a critically unstable system, the relationship between what you put into the system and what you get out uh, isn't linear. So in other words, it's like, imagine trying to play non-linear football. So how far the football goes has n doesn't have a relationship to how hard you push it. So you can kick it hard, it might go a little bit, or you can kick it a little bit, it can go a long way. So the, the Earth's crust is kind of like that. You can just tap it 
and you can release some, a lot of potential energy in a system or, 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 or strain energy in a system, and it can ripple through the whole system. Um, so you're actually, you're just releasing, you're the trigger that releases the stored energy in a system, or else you can push it really hard, but if it's not quite ready to go, because it's such a big system, no matter how hard you push it, it's not really going to go until it's ready. So there's, it's, it's a highly nonlinear system and really, really unpredictable. And as a consequence, it wreaks havoc because we, we don't know exactly when the system's going to go. So how do we approach the problem? The only way to approach this problem, I think it's the consensus view now, is not to try to predict earthquakes, but to understand from an understanding of how tectonics works, um, where the danger zones are. And we know that now. We know how the Earth is working. You know, that has been growing since the mid-1960s. We've learned a huge amount about how the Earth works on a big scale. And identify these places, understand what's possible here, and then it becomes an engineering and an education problem. So if I'm in an earthquake-prone area, instead of trying to predict when the next big earthquake is going to occur, I look at the chances of an earthquake of a given size over a given time window. I might, you, you can do this. You can look at, an, at a given area and say, there's a chance of a magnitude seven earthquake in this area in the next 80 years. So if I'm building a building, I need the building to be able to withstand a magnitude seven earthquake. Um, otherwise, you know, I am exposing people to that, to that danger. So, and people need to know what to do if, they, if, if an earthquake starts. And education is absolutely huge for earthquakes and especially for tsunamis, in tsunami zones, you can save many, many, many people if they know what to do, if they know what the signs are. So it's about engineering and education based on a scientific understanding of the, the global context. Okay. So you, you talked about uh, the energy kind of rippling out through a system in, yeah. in an earthquake, um, which is really kind of coming back in again to, to oscillations. Yeah. I was wondering, could you kind of explain why, you know, there's, there's lots of earthquakes and going on all the time and, and sometimes we have earthquakes that are, are quite large but don't cause huge amounts of, of destruction. Why some earthquakes are, are so, so dangerous? So what, is there something in, in how uh, the wave propagates through, through the crust or in location or in you know, time space? It is what goes into the destructive power of an earthquake? Um, there are two things really. One is the amount of ground, well, the amount of ground shaking is really what will cause an earthquake, and that is an oscillation. So basically, what happens is you've got two pieces of material on either side, and they're trying to slide past each other, or they're trying to push into each other, and eventually they break. And the stress or the strain energy that's built up there drops as what's called a stress drop. So the stress drops in the system, and that stress has to go somewhere. And the analogy might be if you're pulling a, a rope, let's say you're towing a car with a rope and it's got lots of strands in it and one of the strands breaks, what happens? The neighboring strands take up all the stress, but some of the, the rope does this as well. You can imagine the rope would do a little bit of a wiggle as the strand breaks and that wiggle is the wave passing away. So some of the energy in the system travels away. And so what causes the destruction, and that's an oscillation, so these can go away as waves and they travel just like in your systems, they have very high frequency waves and we have very low frequency waves and they travel uh, out away from the system. And what causes the destruction is basically that wave, uh, not just its amplitude, but what's, what we call as acceleration, how quickly it accelerates. You know, I, can, I could take that table and very slowly lift it all the way to the roof and all the way down again. And, I do no, and all the glasses will still stay on it. So I've displaced it hugely, but I haven't done any damage. But if I accelerate it, um, then I can do a lot of damage. So it's the acceleration that you get from an earthquake, the thing that does the damage. So that oscillatory acceleration, and also the buildings. <laughs> How well are the buildings built? Um, and you can make comparisons between countries that spend a lot of money on, on engineering and education and of countries that don't, it won't go into the specifics of that, and the differences are absolutely frightening in terms of the outcomes. So it's really a combination of understanding what the vibrational characteristics, the oscillatory characteristics are going to be, and then engineering a solution for that. So you, you are obviously uh, focused an awful lot on, on earthquake research and how mm -hmm. these waves move through the crust. Yeah. I just wonder, could you tell us a little bit more about what kind of focusing in, in on this particular wave motion can tell you about different systems? So volcanoes, for example. Yeah. Um, well, what you can do, it's, 
you know, earthquakes aren't all bad, because um, <laughs> when earthquake goes off, it is it sends these waves that it that it sends out can be actually used for looking inside in the earth and looking at other structures. It's equivalent to uh, analogous to medical imagery. In medical imagery, you send some sort of a it can be. Uh, you know, a sonic scan or it can be a, an x-ray scan or whatever it is, but you're sending some sort of a wave and you're looking at how that wave bounces off objects that you want to see uh, inside in the patient. And, and essentially we do the same thing. We look at the waves that propagate away from an earthquake. They bounce off structure inside and we can, we can look at how these reflect back and we can build up a picture of what the inside looks like. Um, so we can build up a picture of what the inside of, of volcanoes look like, and we can uh, build up a picture of what the whole Earth looks like based on the oscillations that come back um, from, these, from these waves. But the other thing these things do is they, they uh, very big earthquakes, and you, we talk about large-scale oscillations, and I actually have a video that might be worth looking at. These very big earthquakes set up huge oscillations of the entire Earth. So if you think about it, when, when, the, when the earthquake goes off, you can imagine waves that go like this around the Earth, okay? But if that wave, but the Earth is, is a bounded object, so it's not, it's not just free at both ends. It's like you took a piece of string and you brought it around and tied it to itself, okay, around the edge. So you can think of waves that have this wavelength to go around, but the longer wavelength guys go around like this, the longer wavelength guys like this, and if the wavelength of the waves, the, the distance between crest and, and, and crest gets long enough, it realizes, hey, I'm a bounded object here. I'm not, I can't freely propagate. And the whole Earth starts to wobble or oscillate. And you get these huge free oscillations of the Earth. Is Danny there? I actually have a, a video of this, um, if I can. <laughs> I tell you, this is Zumba, Humba, Ramba, you name it, all the dancing. Just, Danny, if you just click, leave them for a few seconds, click one and leave it for a few seconds and let's see. And then, okay, and try another one. Yeah, if you come down here to eight, eight, yeah, out to your right. Yeah, somewhere out here. Try that. Ooh. So when this is uh, this stuff sets up, or big earthquakes set this up. They set the whole Earth going like this, and it acts at all different modes. So the first one, if you go to the very top one, please, yeah. So this is called the breathing mode. The Earth's going like this, and then you can look at smaller, smaller and smaller scales, higher order oscillations, like spherical harmonic analysis. Essentially, this would, and if you. Yeah, you can see that it, it works at a whole range of frequencies. Now, these amplitudes are hugely exaggerated. <laughs> in, in, <laughs> oh, I didn't, I didn't actually didn't need, I didn't need to say that, did I? Um, these are of the order of a, of a millimeter or so. But, uh, but they're measurable, and you actually can measure them with a, with a gravimeter as well as a very, very broad band seismometer. But it does all sorts of weird stuff. Um, if you actually go to the next slide, please. You can actually see, um, this is an example of, of free oscillations of the Earth, so very large scale oscillations like we've been looking at, that was set up by the uh, Sumatran, what we all know as the Sumatran earthquake in 2004, the one with the very, very large tsunami. And you can see here, these are in milli, uh, millihertz, so this is, this is about 16 minutes here, one. And you can see the next guy is 20 minutes, 35 minutes, you see the little yellow things at the top, uh, 53 minutes, and up the right-hand side is the amplitude, how big these things are. So you're, you saw on the previous slide, you know, you get this, we didn't do toroidal, we just did these. They're going like this and this and this. So this tells you, the height of these spikes tells you how big they are relative to each other. So this on the left-hand side says that this guy here is a very big amplitude. You see the number 53 minutes, that, uh, that cycle takes 53 minutes for the Earth to go out to that, like flatten out like that, and go back again. So it takes, it's a 53 minute oscillation. So we're talking about large scale oscillations here. This is a, a 53 minute oscillation of that shape. This other shape here, this wobbly thing takes 35. This breathing mode here, or sometimes called a football mode, it takes 20 minutes to go in and out like this. And you can see it's a big one. It's a big one, it's a big one. But if you look down, lower down, you see lots of little spikes and peaks. So it's doing all sorts of little things at different amplitudes and at different periods and frequencies. 
So the Earth really is, a, when an earthquake goes off, not only do you get these shaking waves, but you get all this, uh, you know, that, that cause the damage, but you get these wobbly things as well. They don't cause a lot of damage, their amplitude is too low, but what they do is they allow us to say a lot about the whole Earth structure. Because depending on what the Earth is made of inside, you know, how dense it is, how fast waves propagate in it, determine the frequency of the oscillation. If I, if I was to get inside and dig the whole Earth out and fill it with something else and set the same earthquake off again, I would get different times, different periods for the oscillation. They would go faster or slower depending on what's inside. So it allows us to access the gross whole Earth structure just by essentially what you're doing is you're taking the object, you're giving it a bang, and you're just watching what it does. And that tells you what's inside in, in terms of uh, growth structure and materials. Wow, oh, that's crazy. I've never seen that sort of animation before. <laughs> Even if it was grossly animated, it was very entertaining. Um, so talking about sort of gross earth, a whole earth structure, maybe you can leave me on to talking with Ian a little bit about, um, obviously the earth, like you said, uh, Chris, is constantly kind of regenerating itself, you know, it's constantly moving around and, and this outer crust is constantly kind of being reworked and, and remolded. Um, so I don't know, Ian, if you want to come think, in and talk a little bit about... I think on the subject of the Earth, one, one of the fascinating oscillations on a much longer time scale, like million, a million years or so, is the Earth's magnetic field. We think the North Pole's at the North Pole and your compass points to the North, but if you were to wait long enough, you'd find that the magnetic field diminishes and becomes very weak, and then suddenly it pops up the wrong way around, so that your compass would point south. And this came as a great surprise to geologists. What, 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 uh, well, they discovered it because they found successions of lava, and the ancient lava flows going back through time are the oldest ones at the bottom of the pile and the youngest ones at the top. And when lava freezes and goes hard, it, it preserves a record of the Earth's magnetic field. And when they went through the layers, they found that the Earth's magnetic field was one way, one way, one way, and then suddenly it flipped over and was the other way. And clearly something is going on in the Earth's core. We know from uh, studies of earthquakes that the Earth's core is, is liquid. The, 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 what they call S waves, the shaking waves, can't go through the core. So there's li liquid there, it stops them getting through. And, and this means that convection in the core can be very rapid indeed, not like this very, very slow creep in the mantle, but very fast. And clearly something reaches a critical point and flips over every so often. And one of the beautiful results of this is it was basically the proof of plate tectonics because the ocean floor, as for example, uh, North America and Europe was going through, oh, there we are, yes. <laughs> yeah, I can't see it. Um, as North America and Europe were coming apart over the last over the last 60 million years or so, um, lava was continually being erupted at the middle, and it still is today in Iceland. Well, throughout this period, the Earth's magnetic field was flipping. And, and as a result, the rocks formed at the middle, on the, uh, at the middle were either preserving the normal polarity that we have today, or the reverse polarity. And if you go across the Atlantic with, a, with a, a magnetometer to measure the effect of the magnetism preserved in the rocks, you see this alternation of normal and reversed and normal and reversed. When you cross the uh, center of the Atlantic, you get the same pattern again, but in reverse. There's a beautiful um, piece of evidence uh, that was discovered by people I remember from when I was a student long ago in Cambridge when it was just being discovered, quite fun. Anyway, that's, I didn't want to get distracted by the Earth itself because I, I, I think uh, it's important to be aware of oscillations on a much bigger scale altogether. And really what we're talking about is orbital oscillations. In fact, orbits, planets around the sun, um, stars around the center of the galaxy, and particularly uh, planets around distant stars. And I think maybe that's a good place to kick off because when I grew up, <laughs> a long, long time ago, the Earth's... <laughs> Not that long ago, come on. <laughs> it's longer than you think. But, but we were told that, that stars with planets were rare. Much more common with just isolated stars or binary stars and so on. Stars with planets were rare. And, and now, 
the, if you want to look, look up about these exoplanets, extraterrestrial planets, it turns out there's about 400 confirmed and 2,000 waiting to just be confirmed. And these turn out to be more the norm than the exception. Most stars now, it seems, have got planets around them. And the measurement of those, or the detection of those planets, has got an interesting history in its own right. Because if you think of a planet going around a star, the planet doesn't go around the star with the star just sitting still in the middle. The two rotate kind of around their common centre of gravity. So the star in the middle is actually moving in response to the planet going around it. So a star, a distant star, is actually moving towards you and away from you very, very slowly as the planets go around it. And if you show... Have you got there? The, I think it's the next one. It's got... Oh, yeah. I can... Yeah, you can get through. Yeah, this is the spectrum of light from the, from the, from the sun. OK? And all stars have got a spectrum like this. It's really, really spread out, so all the colours now go around the room nearly. But you can see those little lines, those little dark lines are Fraunhofer lines, they're absorption lines in it. And it turns out that these stars that are moving in response to the planets going around them, uh, as they move backwards and forwards, there's a, 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 literally at walking speed, there's enough of a Doppler shift that it can be detected by a very, very carefully constructed telescope, which doesn't move at all, and, and uh, so the first planets were detected by inference because the stars were, were seen to be undergoing this revert to and fro motion in response to something going around. But, but, but more recently, um, uh, many more planets have been discovered um, from looking at the light, the light that comes from distant stars. And it, there's a, an orbiting space telescope called Kepler, if you, if you Google Kepler, you can get some wonderful uh, data and pictures. But what Kepler does it, is it measures very, very precisely the light coming from a star. And it can detect a, a variation of the order of one in 10,000 from the brightness. Very, very subtle dip in. And if we, OK, there's a star. And this is a video, and I, I just took two screenshots from it. Um, but you can see a star and the black dot is, is a planet that's crossing it. It's an, it's an animation. This isn't a real observation, but it's an animation. And you can see the brightness of the star dips a little bit. It was fully bright before the planet got to it. And then as the planet crossed the, uh, across the face of the, the star, so the light dropped. You see the brightness dropping. And if you go to the next shot, you can see it's nearly travelled across the star by now. And you can see the brightness is beginning to pick up again as it's getting to the far side. And these uh, light paths with a little dip and then flat and then a little dip and then a flat are attributed to these planets crossing in front of, of stars. Um, and uh, as I said, we now have evidence of, of several hundred stars and the evidence looks as though these stars are... Uh, sorry, stars with planets are the norm. And it, it, it's very likely that we're going to see within, well, within a few thousand light years, not so far away, <laughs> um, evidence for Earth-like planets, planets the size of the Earth, that are in what they call the comfort zone, where liquid water can be on the surface, potential places for life to exist. Now, the chances, of, if, if there is life communicating, of course, are impossible because the distances are too far to <laughs> communicate. It takes 10,000 years for... <laughs> for, for uh, light to travel, we, there's no way of communicating. But, the, but it's really interesting to know that, 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 that the likelihood is that there, there are planets out there that could support life. Yeah. So, that's it. <laughs> so we've gone as far away from the Earth as we yeah. can nearly get now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, so that's really using oscillations to, you know, the oscillations being quite useful the, in that we can use it to find exoplanets yeah, yeah. And, and know a little bit about them as well. Yes, yeah. I know. I, I, can I, can I to just go on to another aspect of oscillations, which is fascinating, because <laughs> sure. in line with what, 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 what Chris and Connor were say, saying earlier, um, s systems with oscillations are generally in, unstable and occasionally go off and do something completely unpredictable. And it's exactly the same with um, our own uh, solar system. Um, now, if you can flick back... Sorry, these are in a random order. I just threw them together. If you look at the moon through binoculars, you can see something like this, you can see it's, it's heavily cratered. And we've samples of moon rock, um, and they've been dated. 
And it turns out most of the rock on the moon is absolutely bashed and battered from all these uh, impacts from big meteorites that have struck the moon in the past. And it turns out that most of the, the impacting happened in a short space of time, about four, four billion years ago, 4,000 million years ago. It's quite a long time. But interestingly, it's, it's not the beginning of the solar system. It's about 600 million years in, into it. And somehow, the, the number of projectiles zooming around out of control in the solar system to do this bombardment suddenly increased about 600 million years after the beginning of the solar system. And, and no one could, could understand it. But with sophisticated computer modeling, um, it turns out that, it, that there is a mechanism, and people are beginning to believe it now, that the orbits of, go on to the next one, I think it shows, yeah, the, those four circles, inner circles, are the orbits of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune going up from the middle, and the inner orbits are, mi are missing. But beyond the outer orbit, the, beyond the orbit, all those little green dots are small bodies in what's called the Kuiper belt, beyond, beyond Jupiter. And if we go to the next one, you can see it more or less the same. And we, we are now several hundred million years into it. And then suddenly, if we flick from that to the next one, all those Kuiper belts objects are sort of dispersed. And the orbits of Uranus and Neptune have suddenly increased enormously in radius. So going close around the sun, they, they suddenly went much further out. And, and this is because those uh, planets reached, a position, reached some kind of dynamic system where there was resonance between them. And this completely upset the nice stable circles that they were doing and sent all these Kuiper Belt objects scatter, scattering. And we believe that th these are responsible for those enormous craters on the moon. And of course, at the same time, the Earth would have been pelted just as much. But we don't see evidence for it on Earth because plate tectonics on the Earth has com completely and continually destroyed the old surface and, and renewed it. So we just don't see really old rocks, except very rarely on the Earth. So there's a few oscillations for you on a, <laughs> <laughs> on a grand scale. <laughs> and the, you, you obviously showed that picture of the moon, which was extremely heavily cratered. What kind of impact would you speculate would that have had on the Earth? Um, yeah. So, I mean, that amount of impact surely would have quite a significant impact on yeah, whatever crust existed just, at the time. That's right. Um, the, the, the period, the oldest, the oldest rocks on Earth are about the same as the period of this, what they call the late heavy bombardment on the moon, about, about four billion years old, 4,000 million years old. And there's very, very little evidence on Earth today of what, what went on before that time. It's called the Hadean, the dark <laughs> period of, of, of the Earth. And some people have speculated that this heavy, late heavy bombardment would have been so uh, drastic that any life that might have formed might have been wiped out and that life that it eventually evolved didn't get started until after this event was over. But, I mean, that's speculation. We, we don't know. Yeah, but if you look at meteorites... Ah, <laughs> I knew I'd get to it in the end. <laughs> if you look at meteorites, what you're looking at are the very early stages... I think, Maybe we can zoom back to the, the, the disk. There we are. There. OK, yeah. yeah. This is what we think the Earth, uh, well, the solar system looked like. Um, just a few hundred thousand years after it, after it started. The, 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 this was 4,567 million years ago, if you like a nice number to remember. <laughs> If you want it, it's actually 4567.3, plus or minus 0.16. <laughs> and, and that's been produced in, in different laboratories from a large number of, of, uh, of uh, objects from meteorites. Yeah, so it, we've, we think it's getting... Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> a, little bit, uh, a little bit after that, with just a few hundred thousand years afterwards, there was a disk uh, of dust around the newly formed sun, and you can see the small planets beginning to form within, within that disk. The, the dust in the disk uh, aggregated together to form planets. And those small planets, small baby planets or planetesimals, aggregated to make the bigger ones and eventually uh, to make the Earth. But you may know that uh, once you go beyond the orbit of Mars, there's a big gap before you get to Jupiter. And in that gap, there's heaps of tiny little planets called asteroids. 
And, and those asteroids are leftover bits from this stage in the process, yeah, that never made it to, to, to make a full planet. And that's where meteorites come from. So meteorites are samples of pre-planetary, half-made bits that were going to make planets, but somehow never made it. And so we've got an enormously detailed picture of the first five million years of the solar system, which is preserved in meteorites, then this long gap of ignorance before the late heavy bombardment. <laughs> Sorry, I've got a little bit of oscillations there, but I had to... <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. It's very interesting anyway. But, and we've gone very far off planet, I suppose. But uh, it's... So, it, do you want to jump in, Christian? Yeah, actually, I wouldn't mind trying to connect something back to some, something that Connor uh, talked about earlier. And, I mean, what you've shown there with, is that, you know, when, when, the, when the system became unstable, how the whole picture changed, you know, and all these yeah. objects get scattered. So here you have, we think of oscillations, and you talked about a pendulum on its own at the beginning. But if you take one pendulum and hang it on a string, so you tie a string across the room, hang a pendulum on it, you start it swinging. It does its business, as you might expect. If you take another pendulum and tie it off the same string, and then you let one guy swing, this guy will swing for a while, and then the string will start to wobble like this, and then this guy will pick up that swinging, and the other guy will die. So you have now have a coupled system, and there's an interaction between these two systems. Yeah. And what you've shown is this kind of coupling. Yeah. So we can have oscillations. In isolation, maybe are not so interesting, but when you actually have a couple of systems that are oscillating together, things can go really, really, become really, really interesting, or the behavior can be extremely unpredictable. And I mean, this is the power of computer simulations. I mean, I think this problem would not have been, people wouldn't have understood this no, without, without, without the ability to simulate this stuff on large scale computer simulations. You talked about simulating uh, weather systems yeah. and, and climate systems even. Uh, so the question I have for you is, you talked about pushing the atmosphere, and you talked about a guy called Lorenz way back, but if I remember, Lorenz, so one of Lorenz's famous uh, diagrams is he has a system that has kind of two wings on it, and you know, if you're in this part of the system, if you push it out to the edge of the system, you know, eventually things will settle down and stay in that system, but if you push it really hard, you can end up in a new system which might have completely different behavior, like you've shown. You end up with a couple system of oscillation. You end up with completely different behavior. Have you? Aha, I always want. He to has a pen. <laughs> so <laughs> if you, that, that it's, it's have a great you, story. Have you, have you, if you push the climate system, can it go somewhere we you, you, completely you, different? You can. I, I, I just have to draw the Lorenz because you mentioned it, and I love okay. it. Uh, and and uh, it's a wonderful example of how something very seemingly simple can be quite complicated. Um, so we're talking about the Earth system. The Earth system has a phenomenal amount of, of components that we know of, that we try and model, that will interact with each other. Uh, and we're talking about resonance, and we're talking about, um, in, in different ways, we're talking about kind of spherical harmonics uh, and how energy can move between them. And these are very common between the, the formation of the solar system, as I, as I understood you, whole plant, the destruction of these asteroids, uh, and the, uh, the wonderful Earth wobble you showed us, and the way that we solve weather systems. Again, we use spherical harmonics and, and this interchange of energy. But the problem is it's chaotic uh, with the weather. This m looks like it's kind of got two wings. It's, this is called the Lorenz attractor. And you may think, looking at this, uh, and what I think one of the best strengths of humans, which is our ability to, to pick patterns, is also one of our worst weaknesses. Because we, can't, we go crazy if we can't see a pattern. Um, in this one, you go, great, it's, it's got two little bits. And obviously, something's spinning around here. And then maybe every now and then, it goes and it spins over here, and it comes back again. And this is just three, there's just three little things in, the, in, in this system. It's a very simple three equation system. But those lines never cross each other. And if you looked at when it went from here to there, when it went from here to here, the two different lobes of the attractor, it's completely chaotic. It looks like it would have a nice system over and back between the wings, but there's completely no pattern to it. And you can't predict if you're on one side how you'll move to the other. And the weather in the atmosphere is chaotic, so it also has some limit on what we can predict. But a nice way of picturing this is, bear with me, it's summer, and the weather's good in Ireland. It Shock. does happen. Shock. If the weather is really good in Ireland, we've got a, we usually have a great big high pressure system over Ireland. And that means uh, tomorrow will probably be good as well. I mean, without even looking at forecasts or running models, you can say this, because we're in a stable state of the atmosphere. 
In the Lorenz, we could be somewhere around here in the attractor. And if we start off our, our 50 different weather models, because we're not quite sure what's going to happen, all 50 of them will kind of go along a general path and end up here, because we've started off from a fairly stable state. Now we come back to today. It's winter, it's actually technically spring, uh, and the weather's not very good. Okay, so there's, there's clouds, there's rain, there's wind, there's all sorts of crazy stuff going on. <clears throat> We're in an unstable part of the atmosphere. If we run our 50 models now to see what's going to happen in the next few days, some of them will go here, and some of them will go here, which means the set of future possible weather states covers all this area, whereas in the summer, it just covers this little area. So predictability um, in, in the atmosphere, in the weather system, uh, is, contains these wonderful oscillations, these wonderful waves that interact with each other. Sometimes if you start off from a stable state, the way it'll move is, is reasonably predictable, and we can go, yes, it's nice, it's calm, it's going to go this way. If we start off from a fairly unstable state, then the way that they'll, the one pendulum will swing the other in the atmosphere, or the way the asteroids will break up or form, is very difficult to predict, and we could end up having a wonderful day or a horrible day in a very short amount of time. That sounded like a, 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 a plea for forgiveness more than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> well, well I, I, you made me feel slightly better because we generally can predict about three days, but, uh, but apparently you can't predict earthquakes at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I set myself up for that one. So it, if, that's the weather, but if, it, if you talk about the climate, is it possible that we can end up here in the climate system and yeah. you won't know which way the climate's going to go? That's more what there, I was thinking about there, earlier on. There are well. these tipping points in the climate system, and a, a tipping point is when you get a change. Yeah, I, yeah that's why I have to remember what your question was. From maybe one of these areas to another area. So uh, <clears throat> an area where the climate stays within the general bounds of what we see now exactly, to yeah. a situation where the climate changes quite dramatically. And this can and, and probably will happen because it has happened in the past and it probably will happen again. Um, climate change has always happened. Uh, the, the thing that we're interested in is, is how, how much we're changing or how are the forcings of humans uh, is changing the dynamics of the system, or is accelerating the change in the system. Um, some examples are the shutdown of this warm water current from Florida to Ireland. If that stops, which, which will happen, has happened in the past and will happen again, that depends on temperature and, and salinity. If that stops, it would cause massive cooling um, around our area, not only in Ireland, but in Europe. Um, another example that, that people that, that are interested in the climate may have noticed recently is we've, we've reached the lowest recorded level of Arctic ice. So ice, the North Pole isn't actually a landmass at all. It's just a big load of frozen sea. Um, <clears throat> and it grows, more sea freezes in the winter and it shrinks in the summer. Uh, and now that we've had satellites up there, we can actually look at how much ice there is. And this, uh, the past um, minimum extent was the lowest that we've recorded since we were able to record it. There's a very interesting thing that can happen there. The ice in the North Pole were to decrease or disappear. Uh, actually is a stabilizing influence in the climate because the sun, when it shines on ice, the sun drives the whole of our atmosphere. It's the source of energy for our atmosphere. If it hits ice, it reflects and it goes back out into space again. So it in no way heats the Earth system. So that's a bit of a push that we're not getting because it's all being thrown back into space. If we heat the world a little bit, give it a little bit of a, a heating push. Um, it seems at the moment that the part that heats the most is the Arctic, is the North Pole. So we're seeing melting and, and temperature increases in the North Pole that we don't see anywhere else. This is kind of towards the edge, towards the extremes of, of what we're seeing. If the North Pole, melt, North Pole melts faster, then we absorb more sunlight because it's not being reflected into, into the, the atmosphere again. And that will accelerate future warming. And this is called a positive feedback. Uh, and these are situations that we're worried about. We may get a melting of sea ice or a melting of a glacier that can happen maybe over 50 or 60 years, but would take millennia to return again because of this positive feedback that happens. So there are dangerous points beyond which we don't want to cross. Does that answer the question? <laughs> that answers my question. <laughs> okay, so, uh, just losing my mic here. Um, so I think I'm actually going to open it up to the floor now. And if anybody has any questions for anyone here on the panel um, about any sort of macro oscillations, uh, we have some roving mics at the back. If you do want to just put your hand up. 
Thank you. Uh, Jane, in your introduction, you mentioned that uh, oscillations can apply to economic systems as well. And I'm just sitting here wondering, uh, has anybody done any study about the, the relationship between economic oscillation, like the expansion of human activity and the driving of CO2 into the atmosphere and so on? Uh, and is there a relationship between that oscillation and the weather oscillations that you've just been speaking about? Has, has there been any work done on that? Is, is it worthwhile doing any work on that? It's de definitely worthwhile, and th there has been a lot of work done, by, uh, done into that situation. It's kind of a socio-political economic uh, area, <laughs> none of which involved me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very important, and, and we talk about uncertainty, um, uncertainty in trying to know where we are now and in where we're going. And in predicting the weather, what we have to deal with is uncertainty of exactly where we are, but in predicting the future, we need to know what the population will be. We need to know where the population will be and how that population will treat the earth. And I mean very simplistically here, whether we'll cut down trees for different farming, that affects the earth atmosphere. Uh, how much energy this increased population will require affects the amount of greenhouse gases we produce. Um, and there are a, a group of people all over the world that work in this, and, but they come together and put together what are now called um, different uh, regional pathways, or RCPs. Um, there are about four of these that we as climate modelers take. So when I mentioned uh, at the beginning when I was talking that we could be optimistic and say we'll try and limit the amount of greenhouse gas emissions, that scenario is based on, on this research uh, that come together and they form future scenarios of global politics and global economics. And from that, they give us a feed-in on, on land use and greenhouse gas emissions. And then we use that to try and predict the climate. So you can't have one without the other. You absolutely need to know di the dynamics of population and the economy, which drives that. Uh, and they then drive the releases of greenhouse gases, which then we use to model the future of the Earth system. Connor, can I just jump in and tag you onto your question? Um, so for me, like, I, I wonder as well about a shorter scale, um, smaller scale, time and space, um, variations that would link in with, with things like economic activity. So, um, for example, with the Iceland uh, eruption in 2010, there was an impact, a sort of strange impact on climate where, because of all the, the, the contrails and things, there was speculation that there was a variation in kind of the amount of radiation that was making yeah, it to the Earth's yeah. surface. So that you saw a change in temperature just because a volcano erupted and there weren't so many planes in the sky. Yeah. So I wonder is it, if you were thinking as well about kind of economics on a, a smaller time scale, can you, can you track variations because, you know, the entire world's in a bit of a recession? Yeah, the, the ability of a lot of countries to meet their, um, their greenhouse gas emission targets are not being exceeded as much as they would have because of the global recession. And this is an absolute fact. Um, I mean, particularly in Ireland's case, we're finding it easier to stay within or, or somewhat close to our, our goals because we're not, we don't have the construction, the cement plants, all this type of stuff that we're pumping out a mass amount of greenhouse gases. There is no demand for that economy anymore. So therefore, we are not releasing these gases anymore. Um, a now, small, a small I, bonus. I yeah. Guess. Uh, the unfortunate thing is, I, I wouldn't be optimistic that we're going to try and maintain that. I think, I mean, you have to have a balanced view. When the economy starts growing again, people are going to start building again, and people are going to have more demand for things, that higher energy use, and this will result in an increase in greenhouse gas emissions. The job, I think, is to try and get them to do it in a way that that is efficient, as opposed to just going crazy. Okay. Can I make a, a quick point on, on, on that? It's maybe not exactly around the question, but even at a more fundamental level, um, there are strong connections between the type of system that we get uh, through that, uh, say, trading on the stock market and what we see in Earth systems, for example. And um, <clears throat> I mean, in a sense, they're, they're multi-agent systems. So you've got lots and lots and lots and lots of components that are interacting. So although the interaction between one component that the other, it could be one person and, and one activity, is understood, when you have these multiple components that are acting in a, in a systemic way, then you end up with, with, with a very unusual behavior. So it, uh, and, and in a way, this is maybe a real stretch, but we can think of we're biological agents on a physical planet, and we are actually genera we've generated a system that ha has a lot of the same statistical behavior as the, as the planet itself. So say, for example, if I was to take, uh, go along a cliff face and try to measure the strength of a piece of rock, I could take a piece of rock and I could calculate, I could just average, get the average strength of that piece, and I would get a number. Then I would take a bigger piece and I'd get the average strength of that piece, and I'd get a number. Take a bigger piece, I take the average strength, I get a number. 
no matter how much I take, that number doesn't converge. I, don't, I can't find an average property because it actually doesn't have an average because the number I get depends on the, the scale size I look at. And I think the atmosphere has the same problem with, say, temperature fluctuations and so on. It's exactly the same with the stock market. You can take the average price over you know, a few days, a few weeks, and you can keep taking longer and longer time and you don't converge on a single number. So that system, from a dynamic point of view, is behaving very much like uh, the, the way a lot of systems, multi-agent systems behave, although you know, at a first glance they should have nothing to do with each other. They may have nothing to do with each other, but the, systemically they behave in the same way. Uh, any more questions? Hi. Um, uh, you mentioned, uh, this is directed at uh, Dr. Sanders, uh, you mentioned earlier about the magnetic field and uh, how you could uh, track the polarity, the flip in the poles. And I was just wondering how predictable that is. Like, is there a pattern? And um, is there a prediction for when that will next happen? And if so, how that will affect other systems, such as you said that it would, basically the strength of the magnetic field would decrease completely and then reappear, basically. Will that, how will that affect us? And well, um, <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you have a, that scene at the beginning of day after tomorrow in your head, there's <laughs> birds flying into shop windows and well, things. happen. <laughs> yeah. Se seemingly this change in the, in the Earth's magnetic field hasn't had any uh, dramatic effects on, on life, for example. Life's carried on almost regardless. Um, apparently when the field's very low, the influx of uh, cosmic radiation and uh, material ejected from the sun at high speeds, which can which can do damage, which gets into the closer to the surface of the Earth more, more easily because the magnetosphere doesn't have the strength to uh, deflect it. But it's, well, to, to answer your question, no, we don't know when it's going to go next. It behaves in a rather unpredictable way. If you look at um, uh, an ordnance survey map, if you, if you like walking, it's got a, tells you that the magnetic north is decreasing it uh, so many and fractions of a degree in 10 years. But then if you look at a more recent map, you find that that was wrong because it's now <laughs> accelerating <laughs> much more. So, so we don't know. It's, it, it, it's, a, it's a very variable system. The, the strength of the magnetic field certainly has been um, measured. Well, it's been measured by proxy going back about 4,000 years because when you make mud <coughs> when mud bricks are made in Egypt, for example, that preserves the magnetic field and the strength of the magnetic field, and you can reproduce, reproduce uh, the, by making bricks today in today's magnetic field and comparing them with bricks that were made back then, you can see what the strength of the magnetic field were, was back then. And so we know that it really does uh, vary in strength, the magnetic field, uh, oh, of, Factors of 10, it's re really huge. And, and it's seemingly when it gets very, very low, it doesn't always come back up the same way. That's when it flips over. So it, it's a completely chaotic system and unpredictable. So I don't know if that answers your question. Kind of following on from that, uh, do we have a, a good, any idea about what drives the, the flipping? Well, it, I, I, it, it's complicated. Because <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that one. <laughs> well, seemingly the, the Earth's core is, is li liquid uh, and is convecting. And because metal, liquid metal, is a great conductor of electricity, then, then you end up with electrical currents being generated. And these, in turn, create a dynamo effect, which generates this magnetic field. And the magnetic field, its orientation and its strength, just depends on the nature of the convective overturn in the core. And that's the thing, a bit like the weather. It, it, it can change at a whim, and it, there's no way of predicting it. In fact, this, uh, the Lorenz attractor is a, um, a box that's heated at the bottom. And that's all it is, and it's convection within a okay. box. And that so, whole chaotic system so, is just convection of a fluid. So, so it's yeah. difficult to predict. <laughs> Any more questions? This is uh, about weather prediction and so on. Now that we gather more and more data, do you include these kind of data in your models and update them so we will be able to predict the weather more accurate way or something? Yeah, the, um, actually, it's, it's an interesting question, though, because I was thinking the same when, when I said to Ian and Chris. One of the big things that helped us um, 
was the advent of satellites. Uh, when satellites came out, we could see the Earth. Before that, we could only record the Earth. Wherever we had instruments to, to measure the atmosphere or, or weather balloons or ships or planes, we had all these observations. But now we have satellites, and satellites gives us hundreds of thousands of times the number of data that we had before that. And this has dramatically improved our ability to predict the weather. So the skill of a forecast now is about twice of what it would have been 15 years ago. Um, and of course, the second thing that's driving the, the, our ability to, to make more accurate forecasts uh, is the power of computers. So I, I think we're probably all familiar that computers are getting more and more powerful all the time. But even now, with today's most powerful supercomputer, we could use it, and we could use one more powerful. So we are, we are restricted by the number of calculations we can make within a realistic time frame, because we have to tell the guy who's coming on TV what the weather's going to be like in six hours. So we need to do it all within a certain amount of time. Uh, and we're also restricted by the amount of information we have about what the weather's like now. But satellites have, have definitely improved that. And you can see this great leap in skill score since the advent of satellites. Great. Well, I think um, we're kind of running over time a little bit. Um, so I think I'm going to wrap that up uh, now. I've First of all, before I do that, I want to thank all of our panelists, Connor, uh, Chris, and Ian, for their fascinating <laughs> and broad-reaching uh, discussions of macro oscillations. So if we can give them all a hand. And I'd just like to invite you all then to go out and explore um, uh, oscillator if you haven't had a chance to yet. Uh, I think you'll recognize several of the things that were discussed here today. Um, Lorenz's uh, diagram. There's also a, a piece outside that, that touches on the kind of harmonics of earthquakes. We have solar flares uh, out just outside the door here. Um, so go out and enjoy and look for oscillations everywhere. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>